Okay. Um, hopefully everyone had a good bunch. We're ready to get back to this. If you haven't finished some of your labs, there'll be time later during um, the afternoon probably to catch up as you're doing um, the labs that we have this afternoon. So again, this um, presentation is released under the Creative Commons license. You're free to use it um, as you see fit uh, in any way you want. Um, our next module is going to be network visualization and analysis with Cytoscape. And um, in this lab, or sorry, not in this lab, in this lecture, we're going to, I'm gonna introduce you to networks and network visualization. Um, we're also going to uh, be introduced to Cytoscape, which is a network visualization software. And at the end of the lecture, I'm actually gonna go through a live demo of Cytoscape. Um, and afterwards, you guys are gonna get a chance to go through a brief lab where you get to just play around with Cytoscape in general, nothing to do with enrichment analysis that we're gonna do in the second half of the afternoon, just to play around with uh, Cytoscape. So network visualization and analysis, I'm gonna give you a brief introduction of what um, networks are, where they are and how we use them. Um, basic um, background on the basic building blocks of networks. We're then going to look at some different network visualizations and network analysis, and we're going to end off with a demo of Cytoscape, which is a network visualization tool that we're going to be using um, in the program. Sorry, in the in the workshop. So um, everyone's heard the term six degrees of separation. So uh, I like bringing this is in as an example, whereas in reality nowadays, we are so engrossed in networks in our daily lives that we all understand what a network is because everyone's on social networks. So we know how we're connected um, to all these different people around the world, but networks are really everywhere. So the idea of six degrees of separation actually came from a um, experiment um, in, I'm trying to remember the original Milgram experiment. I don't remember in which year it was, but the concept was uh, Stanley Milgram. He had this idea where um, he gave letters to a set of people and he asked them to mail it to six different people and then asked them to mail that letter to six other people. And if on the list as you got it, there was somebody on the list that you know, you were instructed to mail that letter back to the lab. And when they did this experiment, what they found was that there was you know, six degrees of separation between all these people. Um, in the 90s, it was popularized with this Kevin Bacon game where um, you could um, connect Kevin Bacon to any other actor um, based on six steps of, of separation. I don't think Kevin Bacon is the right actor to use nowadays, but in the 80s, in the 90s, Kevin Bacon was the star apparently that you could use. So networks have always been kind of around, but like, how is this relevant now to biology? Um, so networks are actually everywhere in biology, whether it's molecular ne networks, cell-cell communication, which we're also gonna discuss with later in the, um, in the course. Uh, nervous systems is a network of connectivities where, you know, connections from the brain go to your hand, go to your feet, all through a network of nerves that you have in your body. And um, I won't say most importantly, but uh, definitely the way we live our lives, it's social networks, um, Facebook, and other programs demonstrate how close people are, even though we live miles and miles apart. So networks are, are, are really everywhere. So when we talk about networks in biology, why are they important? What, what can they do for us? So some of the very uh, powerful things that a network can do to do for us is it can reduce the complexity. A picture is sometimes worth a thousand words, right? Being able to take your data and visualize it in a picture um, would allows us to understand things a lot better than just looking at a list of genes, looking at a list of connections. It ferments things together and brings things together. This is an example of a network of a SARS-CoV-2 experiment. This was um, done during the height of the pandemic. The red nodes are um, viral proteins. It was a pull down. Um, so it was a protein, a proteomics analysis, right? So the edges represent the interaction that those um, viral proteins have with uh, human genes. Um, and you can see here, there's a, a whole bunch of different um, features that are encapsulated in this network. You can see yellow areas, which represent um, specific human complexes or protein complexes. So the network is actually representing a wealth of information that you couldn't really actually encapsulate with words, right? So it's, it's, it's able to take 
complex information and reduce that complexity in a picture where you can see things a lot better and you can see how things are associated with each other. So why would we use network visualization for biological data? There's a whole bunch of different things that we can represent through networks. We can represent um, biological, uh, sorry, we can represent the relationships between biological molecules, whether it's a protein-protein interaction, whether it's a regulatory interaction where a transcription factor is binding to a protein, or it's an inhibitory interaction where you have a microRNA that's binding to a given uh, region of DNA and it's blocking the transcription of that given gene or protein. Um, it's useful uh, because you can take a large data set, like you can take a massive table, and you can actually um, represent it now as a, as a picture. So instead of having a large table, you can now actually encapsulate all that information in a beautiful picture. Um, and it also allows us to bring different data types in there. We don't just have to have, you know, protein, uh, protein expression or protein interactions. You can actually represent multiple layers of information into that diagram. And last but not least, but then once we have our data in that network, we could then analyze it to pull out additional information, whether it's regulatory motifs, whether it's protein complexes, or whether it's, uh, as we're going to do later, functional groups that are highly connected to each other because they have similar genes. So there's lots of different things that we can now analyze our network for because we've translated our table into a beautiful network. So just a few examples, I guess, here. Um, the example on the, the left-hand side where we have uh, protein complex detection, right? So you could do a protein-protein interaction um, experiment, example, like a protein pull-down where you're pulling down all the, um, we're pulling down specific proteins and finding out which other proteins they interact with. Once you create that network, you could then calculate regions that are highly interconnected and might represent protein complexes. And so this is just an example of um, a study that I believe was done in E. coli where they did um, pull downs of specific proteins and then they built uh, the protein-protein interaction network and they calculated um, potential complexes um, and then verified those complexes through other experiments. Um, another thing we can do with network biology is uh, gene function prediction. This is what we're kind of gonna look at, I think tomorrow, there are different tools that could do it, but you can have a network of, of protein and genes that are associated with each other and you know the function of one or many of the proteins in the group and all of a sudden you have a new protein that's also associated with this group, you can trans transfer some of that functional information onto that new protein, the protein we don't know anything about just by the neighborhood it, it is found in a given network. Um, a few of the other things that we can also um, look at, we can look at motif analysis where we're looking at um, specific regions of the network which are highly interconnected and might represent um, a different level of organization within the network. Another thing that people have also done is network alignment and comparison. So you can have a network that exists in yeast, you can have a network that exists in human, they're similar networks, but there are elements that are added or are missing from one network to the other which could represent different um, evolutionary changes that have happened in the given pathway. So you can compare a given, um, a given network between different species in order to find out different information about how they progressed. Um, and then we can also look at different subnetworks of, of, uh, of these networks to try and find um, specific biomarkers or panels that might represent um, disease. So just the net network basics. A network consists of nodes and edges. And um, the node can, uh, how you define your network is up to you. You can put anything, like when we talk about um, biological networks, we can say that our nodes are genes or proteins or transcripts, drugs or microRNAs, any one of them. When we talk about a social network, the node could be a person, right? How is a person connected to another person? So how you represent your, net your network is how you define your nodes and your edges. The nodes, um, are connected to other nodes via edges. And that edge is also dependent on how you define it. So when we define it in biology, it could be a genetic interaction, it could be a physical interaction, it could be two genes that are co-expressed. Um, it could be uh, DNA binding a regulatory molecule. It does not matter what it is, um, you kind of define it. But the, the premise of a network is you have something that's a node and it, it interacts with something or it connects to something else via an edge. So when we think about networks globally, there are certain things that we can kind of like, um, certain parameters that we can kind of look at, right? So 
topology deals with how the network is um, um, is the number is the number of nodes and it's it's basically a way of describing that network, right? So the number of nodes in the network, number of edges, um, a node degree um, indicates how many edges a given node has. So for example, why is this important? Because it's important to like find hubs in the network. You can have a single person like Kevin Bacon in your social network that is highly connected to all these other actors because they've done a lot of um, acting and uh, because that they're very popular. But the same also exists in a uh, gene or a protein network. You have given genes or proteins that are hubs that are highly prolific with the other genes that they interact with. And they could be very, very important, for example, in cancer. If you hit a hub node, you're gonna break down a lot of systems, right? If you have a mutation or a deletion for a given important node, it could actually deteriorate the network a lot quicker than just, um, than just hitting one of the nodes on the periphery of your network. So topological features are important when you look at, look at, it, look at a network. Um, some other things that we can also do with the network is that we can cluster it and we can um, classify it. So this is an example of a very small, simple network. But within this network, there's actually a lot of pieces of information. We're representing different types of nodes by color and by shape. We are representing um, uh, clusters of nodes by putting the nodes together. Um, or drawing a box around them. So there's a lot of data integration that we can do with these networks that um, are very useful. Another thing that is very helpful with networks is visualization. So obviously we can overlay additional information, right? As, as, as I've shown previously with color and location. Another thing we can also do here is laying out the, the network and filtering the network differently. These four networks that I have here are actually um, ultimately the same network, okay? So A over here is the mass spectrometry analysis of 400 protein-protein uh, uh, interactions, right? That's the whole network. You can then um, focus on an individual uh, sub subset of this network, which is uh, what, what you can see in B, right? So it's the, it's the exact same network. We've taken a little piece out of it and we're looking just at that. Now, in C and in D, it's the exact same thing as B, but we're just laying them out differently. Right, so laying out your network and organizing things can actually highlight different aspects of it. So in C, what we've done is we've circled all of the groups of nodes that are clusters, right? So or clusters or complexes um, based on previous knowledge. So this is this is this hasn't been done necessarily automatically, but for the purpose of of showing how it works, um, those nodes that are circled are part of individual complexes. But now. If you compare B to C, you can see that you're seeing a very different network. It's actually a lot easier to understand what's happening in the in the version of the network that is in C because you've cut you cut it up into little pieces, right? And so the, the next step forward is actually D, where it took out a level of detail. Now that it's collapsed those complexes and just called it complex A, complex B. So you can more easily see the the genes that are interacting with the complexes and how the complexes interact with each other. So another very good tool with networks is this, this concept of um, layouts and being able to portray different messages um, just by structuring your data a little bit differently. So what's missing in these networks, right? This is a, like important kind of thing to just kind of mention, I guess, is that, um, there's no level, there's no uh, indication of dynamics here, right? We don't, you don't see the flow of information. You could have a directed network, um, but even within a directed network, you're not gonna have a start and an end just because you have directions on those nodes, unless you actually physically lay it out that way, which would be a manual process. You don't have that sort of um, dynamics. Um, another thing you don't necessarily have in networks is, is cell type developmental stage. When we talk about protein protein interactions, very rarely do they um, associate where they're happening. You can annotate that on top of your network. It could be an additional feature on top of it, but the underlying network lacks that sort of general information. Okay, so what I just went over very briefly, I guess, was um, networks and how they are important and um, the relationships of, 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 of uh, different objects within our network. Um, it's important to define your network. 
right? Because ultimately a network is just nodes and edges. You kind of have to um, understand what you're looking at or what you're creating. And I mean, I personally think that that's kind of like the beauty of Cytoscape is that it doesn't matter what type of data you have. You can create any type of network. And I know I keep on coming back to it because people understand the social network um, better, but like I've also used Cytoscape, not just for biological networks, uh, we use it to create um, uh, co-publication networks. So a lot of people, when they do their grants, they want to show that they 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 play nicely with other scientists really well. So they pull out all their publications and you can put all the different people you've published with and it makes a pretty graph and everyone likes a pretty picture. So you can also do that within Cytoscape, which we'll go over Cytoscape, the tool in general. But the point is, is that when you create your network, you have to make sure what you're seeing. Okay, so here I'm creating, I'm talking about networks of same protein protein interactions. That's what most people kind of associate a network with, but it doesn't have to be a protein protein interaction because in the next part of this lab, we're actually going to create a network called an enrichment map and it's not a protein protein interaction. So I want to make sure that we, we understand that a network is what you define it as. The important part is that it's a node, that it's two like different nodes interacting via an edge with something else you define the node you define the edge okay so um there's obviously uh lots of different um there's lots of different tools out there um personally i haven't used very many of them because i just use cytoscape cytoscape is a very very powerful um tool um, it's an open source project that's been around i'm going to say for like 20 something years 25 years i'm going to say um, it is a standalone program that is available in Java and you can represent your node, however, your networks, however you like, you define the nodes, you define the edges. Um, it is a, a platform that is developed by many, many institutions. These are not all the current institutions, meaning that some of these people have been involved in the Sciencecape project over the years might not still be available, still be involved, but there's still many, many institutions that are involved within the Sciencecape project. Um, the beauty of Sciencecape is it allows you to um, to do all the things that we discussed previously. There are a whole lot of different layouts that you can use and you can try out. Um, a lot of different places you can pull your networks. So there's a lot of services. You can grab protein interaction networks. You can um, grab functional networks from all these different places. Um, you have the ability to filter and query your network. And you also have the ability to change many visual styles on the network. You can map um, a load of information. It's, it's basically whatever you kind of envision. Um, another beautiful thing about Cytoscape is that the way it is built is that um, it allows for other people to build apps that get incorporated into Cytoscape. And there are currently um, 300, 383 um, apps that you can install in Cytoscape. And they all have different purposes. They're, they're divided up here based on um, all the different types of analysis that you do. Some is a network analysis, some is network generation, some are um, graph analysis. So there's a lot of different tools that you can um, use. Data visualization, network generation, um, graph analysis, um, automation. For me, automation is a big deal because um, even though this is a graphical user interface, you can sit there, you can interact with your network and it's great. Um, if you're doing analysis that involves many, many different files and many, many different uh, things that you have to analyze, sitting there and doing that by hand can be very uh, very annoying. So the ability to automate the whole process makes using Cytoscape really, really easy. So you can actually create your networks. You can manipulate those networks all from R, from Python, whatever programming language you're, you're coming from. So um, these are just like a little bit of the statistics involved in Cytoscape. As I said, it's like a 20 year project. Um, it's highly cited. It's automatable through R or Python using a thing called CyREST, which is um, a RESTful API that is incorporated into Cytoscape. Um, and there are many, many apps which allow us to do many cool things. So this is just a, um, an example of the top 10 apps that there currently are in Cytoscape. And I've highlighted in um, purple the apps that we're actually going to be using um, over the rest of the, the workshop. So we're actually going to get to play around with quite a few different apps. Um, and like the one that we're going over this afternoon is Enrichment Map. But tomorrow you'll be seeing, you'll see Gmania, 
and then react on the fire. Um, and some of them you're going to be using, you might not know you're using because it all happens kind of in the background, but there are um, lots of different apps that we can look at. And I'm just going to highlight two. These are two that we're not using on the workout. We're uh, not working, not using to the workshop. Um, Clue is actually a very popular um, overrepresentation analysis tool um, that's based primarily on Go. And the beauty of Clugo is that you can actually like, like G Profiler, you can put your list in there, um, but it happens in Cytoscape and it creates the network right away from within Cytoscape. So there's no requirement to go to G Profiler or run anything. Um, you don't have the same control with, with Clugo. Um, Veronique had Clugo as one of the, um, one of her columns in her table when she was comparing a bunch of things. So it doesn't, it's certain things, it doesn't have the same amount of control, but it is a, a very popular app in um, Cytoscape. So I wanna make sure that I mention it because it's not, it's not an app that we have developed, um, but it is definitely one you can check out when you guys have your, have a chance. Another one is this, this Cyto Hub, which um, I've actually never used, but it's, um, it looks very, very, uh, it looks like a very, very cool app, and it's helped helps you find clusters within your uh, protein interaction networks. So briefly, I, I just introduced um, Cytoscape. Um, it's a useful free software tool for network visualization analysis. I just I do have to mention this because Cytoscape is programmed in Java. So um, there, are, there are other tools um, available through Cytoscape, like Cytoscape also has a web version, Cytoscape Web, but it tends to be very specific to given tools. Cytoscape in general requires a lot of memory, and that's partly why we make sure you guys have enough memory on your computers. Most of the stuff you're going to look at today are going to be small, but if you go back to your lab and you're dealing with large sets of data and you're trying to create large networks, Cytoscape requires memory. So just wanted to put it as a caveat, uh, but it's still very, very powerful. Just have to keep that in mind if you're dealing with very, very large networks. Yeah. Cloud, no. Um, I actually tend to, like, I do a lot of my work in Docker, but I always have Cytoscape on the main computer and it talks to Cytoscape from the Docker because I know I have more memory on. Unfortunately, you can't run Cytoscape headless, meaning that, like, so you want to compute networks and you don't necessarily need the user interface. You you can't run it without the user interface. So that's why, with, like, you can't run it on a cluster, for example, because you don't have the the image, the... It's something that they've been talking about forever. I just don't know how they would, you still need that interface. 